Welcome to the Construction Brothers Podcast. I'm your host, Tyler Campbell, and with me, like he is every week, my brother, Eddie Campbell. What's up, Tyler? Not much, Eddie. Well, this week, we were talking about computer vision in construction. <sighs> I'm shaking off the cobwebs, guys. I just, I feel like it's been a second since I've been in here. I don't know. And just, I, I don't, that one felt a little bit weird. That intro felt a little weird. You did a good job. Bro. Did I do a good job? Yeah, yeah, you did a good job. Marty, how do you feel about our set design here? <laughs> I, I, you you came in and immediately started roasting us. <laughs> I did not. You did too. You said, are you guys okay? You look like you're in a basement. <laughs> uh, I like it. I like it. I like it. I like it. Oh, it's, oh, it's, yeah, not I as, it's not as, you know, like pa- packaged or something. I like it. Honestly. Man, well, we <laughs> we need to we need plants over in the corner yeah. or something like that. You know, let's let's make it a little more homey. The stark white, messed up masonry wall. Yeah, let's, does kind of scream mom and dad's basement. It you does know? kind we, of. We put this where we needed to. That's what we did. <laughs> <laughs> we put a fern over there and a fern over here. Get the carpet. Be, yeah. yeah, I mean, done. Yeah, we thought about. We thought about doing uh, the interview set up to where we would put the interviewee in between us, too. And we thought about doing between two bros. But then we thought better of it because that anyway. Um, the between two ferns reference. Yeah, there. that just that was just a that's little pretty bit. obscure. I don't know how many would pick up on that. That is, that is a funny, funny little series. Anyway, Marty, how's it going, man? It's been a second. Yeah, going well. Busy, busy, busy. Good, good. All right. So we're here to talk about computer vision today. And uh, you're, you're the resident expert in this, um, at least on this call. So <laughs> we'll <laughs> see. We hope so. We shall see. <laughs> we have a lot of questions for you. So why don't you just tee it up with like, tell us who you are, what you do on the day-to-day, that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. No, I run, I run a company called uh, Always AI. And so we're, we're a computer vision, we're a software company in San Diego. My whole background is in software and uh, mobility. I've done a lot of stuff in Silicon Valley over my career, a lot of different companies that I've worked at and in software. Uh, I started Always AI about uh, four or five years ago, got really, really uh, fascinated by vision and, and how that was going to play out uh, in the tech stack. Um, in, you know, honestly, couldn't really see a future where where vision wasn't going to be just a major impact, like dominant impact. Um, voice, all of us already know that voice is playing out uh, just in terms of, you know, Alexa and what, and what have you. And we started looking at vision and kind of going, well, this is going to have a potentially an even bigger impact. So that was the whole basis for, for starting Always AI and trying to make that accessible to the market, make it easy, you know, like a, a basic developer at a, at a company could say, okay, I, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to leverage, you know, AI techniques to, to figure out how to make cameras smart and kind of do stuff that helps my business. So that's, that's a little bit about my background and, and kind of why we, why we started the company. I'm kind of digging in a little bit. You said, you said mobility. What, what do you mean by that? Cause I, I immediately think of like, Mobility and like your arms and stuff like stretching. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's, good. that's good. <laughs> so uh, I'm I'm a lot older than both you guys. So yeah, I went through the whole uh, what I would call mobile enterprise uh, explosion in the in the aughts in the 2000s. And what was that? That was really when smartphones were really coming into the market, and people and companies were kind of like, okay, what can this do for me, which now seems so just obvious, but at that time it was like, what do, what what can I do here beyond email and text and messaging and so forth? And that's when applications just exploded out on the edge. So it was, oh, I can approve a job a job rack on my phone, or oh, I can pay a bill on my phone. And so went through that whole that whole area. I was running a, a big subsidiary of a company that was doing mobile messaging. And, you know, for, for enterprise applications, I don't know if you guys have heard of a company like Twilio, kind of similar to that, to that. So that, that's what I mean. It was kind of the whole, the mobile trend that just hit big time in kind of like the, 
early to mid 2000s. And then obviously we've been riding that way ever since. Nothing to do with mobility in your arms, by the way. Nothing right? except that we all hold our phones up. And, <laughs> with your <laughs> arms. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's how we work <laughs> Listen, out now. We're very, like, very good. Um, um, nice tie in. I'm the resident moron. So we've established that. Um, I was reestablishing. You know, thank, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> all right. So. You went through all of that. Now, I mean, always AI. You guys are doing computer vision. Like, what specifically with computer vision are you guys trying to accomplish when it comes to construction? Yeah. So we're. I mean, so at, at the highest level, we're trying to take existing cameras that are out there already installed and embed AI techniques in actually on the cameras, so then they can do more. Right, they can do a lot more for you out on what's called the edge, right? Out on the edge where the cameras in the real world, where the cameras actually are. So it's taking this whole world of artificial intelligence that we read about all the time, and it's applying those those techniques onto cameras. So then what is so now what are the cameras doing? So the cameras now can do things like look at objects that you want them to see and you know, track materials or track PPE equipment or certain areas or, you know, what do you want it to do? What kind of intelligence do you want that camera actually generating, right? So that sounds easy, but, you know, AI techniques have really, there's something called deep learning, which has really just totally transformed uh, tech and transformed AI. So it's taking those techniques, putting them on cameras. So then in construction, We've seen just a ton of interest around a whole bunch of different applications. And I'm not a construction expert, but, you know, we've had just tons of conversations with large contractors. And uh, we just we just did a deal with a, a big uh, data center company and, and all kinds of different things going on in the real world. Uh, and it's all about cameras that are helping, you know, either for safety or maybe for materials tracking or progress tracking. It's trying to make things just more efficient. Um, and trying to get information like now, like right now, so I can actually act on it in real time to help my my project, right? It's all about margins and trying to improve my margins. So cameras can really, really help that. They're not that expensive. And so that's what we're, we're trying to help. My mind immediately starts going to like PPE and safety. Um, AI, you're, you're, you're having to help uh, the system learn, identify certain pieces of PPE. So what's that process look like? Yeah, so that's a great question. So it's that's a great, great example. So let's say we want to know who's on the job site, like are, are these people that should be on the job site? And then if they're on the job site, are they are they wearing the proper protective equipment that we've asked them to wear or that our insurance company is insisting that they wear? Uh, and so, yeah, you train what's called an AI model. And all that really means is just you're collecting a bunch of images of, of hard hats and goggles and protective vests and, and whatever it is. And you're collecting all that, all that data. And then you build what's called an AI model based on that data. And then you ask the camera to say, okay, now go detect. Are those the right people on the site? Are those people wearing the right PPE equipment? So it does that in real time. Um, and it's giving you that information in real time. So if you, for example, there's a bunch of people on the site that shouldn't be there, or you've got a bunch of people doing dangerous things and they're not wearing PPE, then it'll it'll identify a manager just in real time so they can actually do something about it. But that's what it is. You, you got to collect data first, which is really just images, video clips, stuff that a lot of construction sites already have. So it's really not that hard to get it. And then you apply those techniques I mentioned earlier, these deep learning techniques to train a model. And all a model is, is just think of like, it's like your brain. It's like an algorithm that goes, oh, I'm just looking. Is that a hat? Is that a hat? Is that, oh, that's a hat. Okay. And, and it's doing that. And the camera is literally just a, a looking at things and saying, okay, is that a hat? Is that, are those goggles? Is that a person that I know? Is that it's asking those questions in real time? So that that whole process is called computer vision application development and deployment. Does it have issues with 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 accuracy sometimes? Right. So I'm, I'm thinking of of safety glasses specifically. There are a lot of clear ones 
on the market and sometimes those blend it. Will it have trouble picking up on those and, and flag occasionally? Yeah, no, great, great question. Yeah, no, absolutely. So you deal with all kinds of, you know, the human brain just goes, oh, okay, it's, it's bright outside. I need to move over here. Or those are clear. You know, you're trying to train a machine to say that really clear looking thing on a face is, is a goggle. You might have to get images from the side or you might have to do it in different lighting conditions. So there's all kinds of variables um, that you need to take into account when you're building the model. So the model's accurate. Otherwise, you're right. You get garbage or you get inaccurate. It's, it's not worth it. If I'm the construction manager, I'm like, look, this thing's like 25% accurate. It's not helping. So you need to work on it and build the accuracy and so forth, which usually just in the world of AI, it's not that complicated. It literally just means get me more data, right? So the machine can just learn from more instances and kind of go, oh, those are goggles, right? Okay, I need to, okay, those are goggles. And then it gets kind of smarter as it goes. But yeah, there's all kinds of things that you have to account for as you're, as you're building these, these models. The good news is you can do it. Reminds me of um, the early days of BIM with mm-hmm. clash detection. There was a lot of like, there were a lot of what I'll call false positives in clash, right? So I would think that this would be similar to that. Like you would run the risk of having a lot of false positives and a lot of like, hey, red alert, but it's, yeah, it's, it's fine. Right. And, and usually when we work with clients, they'll say, look, I need at least 85% accuracy. Right? There's some metric that has to be met. So we're, we're working with one construction company and they have a safety index, they call it. And it's a kind of an, a, it's a combination of are people wearing what they should wear? Are they in zones that they should be in, et cetera? And they have a metric, let's call it a number, like 75. If I'm 75 or above, it's safe. I'm, I'm meeting my metric. If I'm below 75, I got to take some action, right? So that's where computer vision is great because you could have cheap cameras that are basically giving you that information versus maybe you've got people that are supposed to be collecting that information. It's kind of hard. It takes time, uh, et cetera. But but yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of, I'll give you another example. So we're working at another construction company that owns a big uh, timber manufacturing facility. Um, you know, wood, think about planks of wood stacked up together. If you look at the side, they all looks very similar. Is that one plank or is that 10 planks, right? So those type things have to be taken into account as you're, as you're building these uh, these apps. So you, I mean, I mean, in that case, though, you, if you're looking at the side, you can easily get counts of lumber from that data as well. So f- material lists, or you know, just picking up quantities. I mean, have you guys done anything with that that you could tell us about? Yeah, we we work with a lot of. I'll give you an, an analogy. So we work with tons of retailers. Um, just think of like Burger King or, you know, chains, they're obsessed with, you know, how many people are coming into my store. Don't double count those people, right? Don't count employees. I just want to know actual. So this like in a job site, it'd be like, how many workers do I have? You know, I want to count specifically how many. So yeah, counting the number of things, a thing could be a person, could be vehicles coming onto a site, et cetera. That's very common making sure they're distinct. So you don't double count, you don't get like you called false positives or double counting, I'm getting inaccurate data. You wanna make sure you're not doing that. And and you wanna protect privacy as well, right? So in almost all those situations, we blur blur the personal identity of, of the person, right? We don't wanna, we're just saying that's a person. I don't need to know that's Marty Beer, right? That's that's a person. But yeah, counting is really common. And that helps people determine kind of like speed of service or, okay, I've got 10 people came in. How long did it take them to get through that Burger King end to end? And at the end of the day, they want to optimize that time, make less mistakes and improve their margins, right? It'd be the same thing on a construction side, like how much material was actually delivered, right? And is that where was it used? How much was used? You know, so you could get into quantity that way. It gives you a ton of options because if you're if you're able to use a cheaper camera setup, this is very accessible. So I mean, what, get into the can you get into the setup of this and like what that looks like behind the scenes? So I have this camera that's great, but 
then, then what? What do we what do we do with so it? So let's yeah, let's work backwards. So most of these cameras are so called just IP cameras, which means they can connect to Wi-Fi. They can connect to the internet, and that's the vast majority of cameras out there today, right? So that's a very very common, and that could be a you know a seventy dollar camera or something like that, right? A lot of these cameras already are already installed, right? They already they already exist. So that's the sensor, that's the eye. That's the thing that's just looking and collecting images, right? The actual AI algorithm sits in what's called an edge device that's different. So the cameras connect to a, a box. So what is that box? That could be a laptop. That could be, have you guys heard of, you know, NVIDIA is a huge, you know, company that sells a lot of so-called edge devices they have cool names like Jetson and so forth. They're basically a few hundred bucks. And what is it? It's a device that the cameras are connected into. The algorithm, that model I talked about, that's where it sits. And that's where it's it's crunching and saying, is that camera looking at a, a vehicle, a person? Uh, whatever you've trained it to look for is getting actually calculated in that, in that camera or in the cloud. So you're like, I don't want an edge edge device like in the video, I just want to go right into the cloud. Fine. So then you could just connect right, you know, right into Amazon or something like that. And again, that's where the, the brain is sitting there. That's where the AI calculation is actually occurring. It's called inference. And so you got the cameras, they're just feeding in images into the edge device or the cloud. That's where the AI magic happens. And then that's spitting out information to you, the user on some you know web site or something like that that's just showing you the data that you want uh in real time so that i mean that's that's basically it it's not most of the companies we work with don't have to buy any new cameras they may have to invest in a in a edge processor or in the cloud processing but let's call that like a it could be like a few hundred dollars something that's not a lot of money so we're not talking a huge amount of money uh, and then that's that's primarily it, right? So we're we're the software guys to make sure that whole thing works. Yeah, that's that's basically it. The last part is the, you know, everybody comes up with like Silicon Valley loves all its like terms like inference and you know <laughs> analytics. You're like, what do you mean? Oh, where I see stuff? Okay, yeah. So that that's just you have a dashboard where you're looking at the information that's coming from those cameras on your job site and your you're seeing how many people and how many vehicles and you're getting whatever information you wanted displayed for you. So, uh, so that's, that's the, the whole process. The, the most intensive part of that whole process is building the algorithm, building the model, right? That's training the brain. That's, that's the, the, the hardest part and most important part. What other applications have you seen that are really cool? And that can, I mean, that doesn't have to be construction. Like we've talked PPE, we talk counting, like just a cool application of this. Yeah, I mean, there's, it's kind of amazing what, what people are doing. So I'll give you a mining, so mining companies. So just imagine a enormous mine and they have, let's say a 2,500 foot shaft going down and collecting something. Probably in, in our world today, it's probably something like cobalt or something like that, which is used in all our smartphones and laptops and, and our EVs and everything else, right? And that mind wants to know, okay, exactly how long does it take to go through all the phases of loading, you know, loading up the, the, the thing that's going to basically go down, blast, collect what was blasted bring it back up, unload it, et cetera. How long is that end-to-end -end cycle? Um, and so you have, in this case, just a two cameras, one looking down the shaft and one kind of on the outside. And it's watching each one of those steps. Let's say there's five key steps. How long did it take in step one? How long did it take in step two, step three? So you're literally getting like very, very detailed information on how long it took. Now, obviously, in, in this case, if they save literally like 1% of the time, it could be twenty five dollars to $100,000 per day in savings, right? Just, just by, by improving that, that process. 
okay, now let's go to a, a, a like a Burger King. <laughs> Same thing though. That one's like literally somebody ordered a burger. Okay. I first grab the bread and then I add the condiments and then I add the meat and then I do this. It's five steps. How long did it take to go through the five steps? Um, could I do that faster? Am I wasting food? Am I, you know, so that that's, that's like another example. Um, we work with a defense contractor. They do nighttime stuff, infrared stuff that gets pretty gnarly. And uh, so, so that one's kind of, um, let's just call it object detection. It's probably a good way to call it. And uh, is that a safe object or an unsafe object you know that i'm that i'm looking at and so that's kind of a different one because it's nighttime and it's got all kinds of different different technical ch- challenges but uh yeah just there's a lot of a lot of different uh, body movement is is popular in sports so really getting down into the analytics about okay with somebody's arms like this you hit 45 percent of your three pointers and if it's like that you're dropping down to 19%. So you're getting to this fine grain body movement and that's really sophisticated, you know, analytics happening and obviously for professional sports, there's so much money in that. But uh, yeah, those, those are examples. Didn't that happen in the world cup too? Didn't they use AI to, to track inbounds, out of bounds, offsides, that sort of thing? They did. I, I believe that's, yeah, I think that's, I think you're right. Yeah, it's it's being used in um, all kinds of sports, you know, activities. And there's something called pose estimation, which is, again, Silicon Valley's coming up with like, oh, you mean body movement? <laughs> <laughs> so well, why don't you call it body movement? <laughs> anyway, so body movement and that gets important. Like a lot of medical applications, people are like using that to try to help people understand if you, you know, if you're moving a certain way, you might hurt yourself and what have you. But uh, yeah, so there's, you know, cameras, think about it. Our eyes is probably the most powerful, you know, sense that we have. I mean, you could argue, but let's just say it's, if it's not number one, it's top two. We just, what we take for granted and what we see and everything, how much we rely on our vision. We're just entering this world where more and more of that, of the human brain capabilities getting pushed out into machines out on, out on the edge. I mean, if I was coming, you know, coming out of school, it's kind of funny, like, especially with chat GPT. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. Oh, we're familiar. <laughs> and to me, like working in the real world, like in construction, where high tech techniques are getting pushed out into the real world, it's so much more interesting than, OK, I'm going to go sit behind a, you know, a cube at a big technology company and code. Like the tech is actually moving your guys way into the real world, right into the built world. And it's it's coming there. So it's not only can you learn all those techniques, like deep learning, computer vision, but you, you can actually apply them out in the real world, which I, I think is just super cool. So we're talking about, you know, tracking things and productivity and all of that begs the question, how are the workers responding to this? Um, have you seen any pushback um, from people out in the field that, you know, they're like, no, you're not going to track me, get away from me, that sort of thing? Yeah, absolutely. Here, I'll go through the the common complaints and then maybe some of the, the advantages that people may, may not think about. But on the, yeah, on the complaints, it's like, look, it's like, you don't trust me, right? There's a, and it's kind of, no, it's, it's, but we don't want you getting on a roof without a helmet, right? Um, it's probably not a a good idea or, or what have you. So I think, yeah, there's, there's issues around privacy and uh, we're, we're asked, as I said earlier, to blur faces. And a lot of this is people detection. It's not facial recognition. That's, these are two totally, one's like, that's a person. The other one's like, that's Marty Beard. In most cases, I would have to actually opt in for that. I would have to say, I'm okay with you tracking me, right? I'm, legally, you would have to opt in for that for, for somebody to have that capability. But so I, th- I think privacy is, is definitely, uh, definitely up there. Uh, and then people worry about, okay, am I, am I doing something wrong or I'm not doing something as efficient or, or what have you. But on the other, on the other side of that is there's just massive labor constraint in every industry that I'm dealing with. And automation literally is coming 10 years faster than it probably would have without the, the pandemic. Right. I mean, it's, literally leapfrog like five, 10 years ahead of what people were planning uh, just because there's not labor. It's just, you can't. So it's like, okay, where does it logically help? And showing that it can help, right? Cameras can do that. 
we're, you know, we're having a hard time hiring somebody, maybe we can do that. So I think there's there's some give and take on on both sides, and we're just going to have to to work through it. But I'm I'm very I totally understand the the pushback. If I was working on a site, I wouldn't want I wouldn't want that. I'd want to know that my face was blurred and so forth. On the other hand, if if I could be doing something more efficiently or providing more value or you know, then great. You know, I'd probably be open to it. So I, I of course, have to go back to the sports analogies because I can't. Okay. He can't can't, help himself. I can't not. Do it. (laughs) Um, Baseball, one of the things that was kind of a breakthrough back when was being able to, I mean, when you get the camcorder out, you'd catch yourself swinging on video. Then you'd go back and you would slow it down. And then with your eyes, you would look at the video and try to identify mechanical flaws in your swing you got your elbow here you got your hands there you were late you were early you you know you didn't identify the pitch your head came off so you're just watching now you're taking ai deep learning and teaching the software hey this is what to look for now the naked eye isn't what you're relying on to make sure you pick up on all of it and now I get to apply that. So uh, there is an element of observation, but then there's also an element of reporting. That's the you know Silicon Valley dashboard we're talking about, right? That's what I get to look at. That's right. W- what kind of reporting do, like are people interested in? Like I want to know if I've got my elbow or, or whatever in baseball, but for for other industries, I, I know we don't. This isn't us doing this, but I know a, a computer vision um, company that works uh, in professional soccer, right? And they work with the Premier League. And what they do is basically um, try to identify, look, when you kick the soccer ball this way, you, you're going to injure yourself, right? And so these are these athletes are, as you know, like in Premier League are multi, 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 multi million dollar contracts, right? So there, there's a lot of focus on on preventing injury and using computer vision to basically say, when you, you know, and it's, so it's the data set would be specific to a player and the data set would highlight injury vulnerability when you do the following things. So then it'll show that player like, look, when you when you kick it this way or you run up like this, I mean, you're 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 within, you know, 40 percent higher chance of injury than than otherwise. That's one example. The other one I told you earlier, which was basketball and how somebody, you know, you're literally getting at a dashboard on the success of your shot when you're when you're a certain way versus another another way when your body is a different way. So it's just mind blowing, right? And it's kind of like it's getting it's getting to that to that level. Tennis players use it a lot um, at you know at the highest level they're using it. Again, it's about power and injury prevention. And this is this is automated. First. This is no no. This is automated money ball. Exactly. That's it. Okay. Well, did you go there too? Like mm. the movie Moneyball? It's it's that's what it is. It is. I, actually, I did. I was going to come back in and weave back into construction with that example. Okay. All right, fine. We always a construction. We always. But Moneyball is cool. Yeah. <laughs> Moneyball is cool. I'm bringing up baseball here, man. I'm I'm just I'm throwing you a bone. What in the world? You're trying we to go back to stay construction? There an hour and a half. <laughs> trust me. I mean, I wanted to go with automated strike zones, and I stayed away. You know. So, all right. Now, I'm thinking in the construction, maybe more in manufacturing, one of the things we talk about is being on the right side of the work. Oh, yes. Right? And and getting yourself out of position in an observable setting. Like, Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are some things that would inhibit what an observable setting is. But if we could get a vantage point of a person, you could actually do that sort of like preventative reporting to tell the person they're more likely to get themselves into a situation where they're going to have to have a back surgery in 10 years. And that's a, that's a cool projection of this tech. I, I don't know if we're seeing that maybe yet, but that, that could be an amazing application of the same principles. No, yeah, that's, that would, and that, that's a great example. That would be the pose estimation where, you know, there's lots of injuries when people are doing, doing the following and just getting educated about that. Let's 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 not do that. I'll, I'll give you another example. Is um, so this lumber manufacturing that I that I mentioned. Just just an, envision a huge lumber manufacturing facility where wood comes in, then it goes through the cutter, then it gets prepped, and then it comes out the other side. And you've got people involved in that. The company we're working with has these cameras looking down on that whole process, and they create zones. 
each zone kind of does a different thing. And they're really concerned about safety, super dangerous environment. You got saws and all kinds of things going on. So they're, they're looking at both the process of the lumber going through as well as where are the people, you know, during that process, where should they be and where should they not be? And are they wearing the right, the right gear and so forth? Totally can reduce the number of incidents. Totally can reduce it, right? Even to the point of things like there's a, a, a knot in the middle of that wood, which might get cut, you know, caught and, and cause some issues. And the camera can identify that before it, you know, it enters the, the cutter and so forth. So there's all kinds of things that we've just kind of done without machines up to this point. We just kind of run the risk. And Have you done anything where, where you put up like an invisible fence, right? So I'm, think, I'm thinking of the lumber mill, right? If somebody steps across the line or something, you can immediately hit a siren. Is that, I mean, that'd be possible, I would think. That is, uh, yeah, it's a... Uh, Silicon Valley again, a virtual perimeter. <laughs> so <laughs> you knew I was, you knew that was coming. Yeah, that's a virtual perimeter. Obviously, schools are looking at that, um, and uh, you know, unfortunately, with all the incidents we've had on on, on schools, so they they are creating a quote a virtual perimeter uh, around the school where you could say, okay, I don't recognize that vehicle or I don't recognize uh, that person. There's a museum that we've worked with where they have certain items that people just can't stop touching. <laughs> like <laughs> don't touch that 2,500 year old thing, please. And people just, Oh, what is that? I want to, you know, they want to touch it. So they have a, a virtual perimeter in, in front of that's like just using different examples, but yeah, that's, that is a common application as well. Increasingly used in a lot of different in, environments. There's a, uh, sports stadium, back to sports, sorry, that uh, in LA, and they've got a fence around this ginormous building, uh, and people hop over the fence, right? And so they've got a perimeter before the perimeter where they're kind of like, okay, strange things are happening, et cetera. So anyway, people are looking at, at computer vision for a lot of these virtual perimeter applications. And secure, yeah, security functions. That's, I mean, yeah. I could take this so I know, political right? right now, but what? I'm not going to. <laughs> no, don't you <laughs> dare. Don't okay. you dare. No, no, no. Getting out of there. That's All right, QC. I, I want to go to QC because I had this like brainstorm and I want to know, Marty, I want to, I want to know if you think I'm crazy, but the ability <laughs> for computer vision to like say we work in steel, so I got a steel column that comes through a line and – uh, I want to compare that to what I've modeled. Um, now, deep learning, I feel like would be the problem in this, but could you see where we could break through the threshold of being able to read out model data, learn fast enough, and then turn that into something that we can QC later, perhaps even um, UT test welds, identify basic plate objects and things of this nature and make sure that everything's present on a piece? Yeah, I mean, look, um, you just reminded me of, uh, we worked with a um, steel manufacturer for an automobile supplier, and um, they wanted to identify problems on the steel before it went too far down the line, and they would have to stop the line and go back. So it was looking for anomalies. It was really hard. And the reason it was hard is the anomaly might be might be like a bubble or something quite small, and it all kind of looks the same. Right. So, so how do you solve that? You just need more data, you need more examples, more examples, more examples, more data. So it's a long, kind of a long answer for, yeah, I think, I think what you're saying could be done, but I don't want to make it sound like a lot of, you know, that type of stuff is, is easy. I think it would, it would require a lot of images and a lot of different examples and so forth to get there, but there's no reason you couldn't take a snapshot. Right. I think that's what you're saying. And then you have to educate me because you said QC. I don't, I don't know. What Qu so qu quality control. Quality control. Oh, okay. Sorry, yeah, quality very yeah. non-Silicon Valley uh, terminology. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're, dro <laughs> you're dropping acronyms on me, you know. So I'm like, <laughs> yeah, might be, yeah, might you. Be. That's bad. You could, no, you <laughs> could, you could. I mean, you're comparing two things, right? Yes. So yeah, you're basically saying, does this match this? You know? Yeah, right. it's, it's model data, and you can extract out that part, that specific part. And then even if you needed more data, I mean, good grief, they're, they're, we're getting laser scanners now that are crazy accurate that I, I don't know if you've ever played with scan data, 
and use that for comparison, that might be an interesting thing to to talk about. <laughs> haven't done, yeah, haven't done that. Haven't haven't done that yet. But that, yeah, I mean, I think before and after, before and after. That's anomaly. You're looking for anomalies, right? So this is the way it should be, and then this is the way it is. We haven't done this yet, but computer vision is used a lot in in like, for example, skin cancer screening, where it's kind of like, okay. It shouldn't look like that. Ah, okay, that that looks unusual, right? Maybe we should take a deeper look at that. It's like a highly, highly accurate for that. Um, so certain medical conditions and so forth. So again, it's just it's cameras being trained to look for certain things or differences. How do you do that? You do it based on all the the data. What is the data? It's images, video clips. The thing that's really strange that like we're we're starting to enter a world where okay, I need data and I need video clips, but if you don't have them, I'll just get synthetic examples. And what that means is I'll just go on the internet and I'll just make up the examples. So I'll create a data set based on not real stuff and then I'll just apply it to the real world, right? So we're, we're starting to like, and this is getting kind of on, on the edge of computer vision, but this is really starting to happen where it's like, okay, I don't have exact images of this construction site or this material or these people or what have you. Not a problem. I'll create makeup data that I just download and process and make it part of my algorithm. And guess what? It actually works. It works. Or I need images with moonlight hitting it. Okay, I'll just get that off. I'll create that. So we're we're kind of it's it's super interesting where the world you know this blending of real and 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 so called digital or synthetic is starting to happen a lot more. Okay, all right. So I got I got to ask since we since we have the Silicon Valley guy here. All right. So what do you see happening with this in the next five to ten years? All right. I know it's going to get more accurate and all of that, but what other use cases do you see coming down the pipe? that that we could anticipate yeah great i mean great. that's that's the question right um i think in our in our daily lives it's it's going to be playing out all over the place right so it's not far-fetched to like okay i walk into starbucks and i've given them the, the I'm, I'm okay that they know i walked in uh and the camera identified me and they've already got my large latte ready, ready to go i mean that's not that far away. so 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 that that, you know, something like that is going to be happening. The other one is, I think you just walk into a store and you grab the items you want. You put them down on on like a kiosk. There's nobody. And it just identifies every object and you walk up. So a lot of this is coming a lot faster than people realize where you just, I don't know, in your guys' neck of the woods, if you have Vons or Safeway or I'm not sure what, but whatever the big grocery chain is they're going to have more and more just kind of computer vision is going to be used for the whole checkout process where you literally just put down on and it you have cameras looking down at the items and to the side it accurately identifies all the items tells you it's you know how much money it is and you tap your phone and you move on that's just like another example you know i think i think it's going to play out just in our lives all all, all over the place right and in our medical you know when we go for medical help um, obviously our cars are starting to incorporate more and more computer vision you know will we have fully autonomous driving doesn't i don't i'm not an expert in that space but computer vision is already used big time in all of our cars right and we'll just continue to get more more sophisticated so i think Long answer to your question, which is, I think it's it's going to be a pervasive part of our lives, even if we don't really realize it, right? <laughs> it just become part of like part of part of what's happening. I mean, that's kind of the case with like Chat GPT and everything too. I mean, on that side of it, it's you know people are going to just start being able to get that first crap draft out of the way of anything that they want to create. <laughs> that's absolutely and true. Be able to tweak from there, like it's. I mean, the next the next 10, 15 years are going to be insane. And then the costs come down, right? So the costs all, like in most tech, the cost of that camera or that edge device or the processing just kind of comes down, 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 down over, over time. The quality is getting so good too. Like, I mean, the cameras that I'm using now versus what I was using whenever I started are insane. Like crap, my, my iPhone is better than my first DSLR that I bought by like by far. And I think like we're also going to see pressure from, for example, ins insurance companies are going to insist 
that you have it. In other words, they wouldn't insure a building if it wasn't using computer vision to make sure that things were you know, safe and materials are being properly used or whatever it was. And so a lot of insurance companies are looking at this like, well, you better have computer vision implemented, right? I can't imagine going to like a big industry event where you've got a booth and you don't have cameras that want to understand how many people went by your booth or weren't employees, and, right? So it's just going to, I think the cost is going to be not so intense that a lot of people are going to be using this this type of stuff all over. All well, it'll drive the cost of insurance down. My, my wife, uh, she uh, signed me up for, for uh, Drive Safe and Save or something like that, that stay farm thing. And that's what, what, what? How's it going? It's, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> um, anyway, pretty heavy breaker uh, and accelerator. So, it, yeah, she stuck it in my windshield, though, and that gives me a, a discount, basically, because... It tracks how much I break, how much I accept, like all of that crap. So I worry, though, that I would not get a discount. I know, know, right? (laughs) She was putting that in there. I was like, that might work for you, honey, but not for me. (laughs) (laughs) Same. Dang it. (laughs) Why why did our insurance bill go up? But I mean, good point there is that, I mean, yeah, insurance companies require you to have this on there because, I mean, shoot, for a lot of contractors, that could drive their rates down like crazy. I I was reading, I think insurance is something like 5% of overhead costs on average on a, on a construction, in a construction, you know, like in a average, that's a lot of money. So, so if you could reduce that by, you know, get that 5% down to 3% or something that, that would drop right to the bottom line. Right. So, yeah. So I think, I think people are going to, well, I think people are going to look at it less as a threat and a little bit more of like, all right, how, how can this thing help? Me? I've got a math question because <laughs> yes, I'm Eddie. not very good at it. But does that mean <laughs> that for every 20 buildings built, we ensure the ability to rebuild a whole building? Would that equate? I don't think so, because I think I think what I was saying is there's some portion of you got your direct costs like labor and materials. Right. And then you've got kind of indirect costs, and then you have this kind of like overhead. So just in the overhead bucket, and I don't know how much overhead there is on a normal construction project, but let's call it like 20% or something, um, 5% of that. I'm glad we clarified. I just wanted to clarify. You have to build a yeah. lot of buildings. <laughs> yeah, okay. Because I'm, I'm <laughs> going, wow, that's okay. That's doomsday, it's right? <laughs> no, it's, but I mean, Think about it. You guys all, we all pay insurance, right? I mean, it's it's expensive and going up, right? And so maybe this is a way. I met a, I was at a construction industry event and I was having lunch next to this gentleman and he literally had written a million dollar check for, they had a person on their job site in Sacramento that had fallen off a roof. And that person thankfully survived, but was quite, you know, pretty badly injured, sued the company, company bought it, they lost a million bucks, right? So he was asking me, he was like, now, wait a minute, tell me again. So the camera could have identified that that person didn't, in this case, wasn't roped in appropriately and could have fired off an SMS to the to the site manager in real time. It's like, yeah, that's exactly what we could have. So with that, you know, and he's like, that I could have, you know, it's like, yeah, that, that, so the ROI there is obviously really high if you were able to. Plus, you don't have a guy that's injured. Do you have an average cost of installation for this? Like, I mean, I know your cameras can be, you know, say a hundred to a thousand bucks, depending on what you get. Yeah, I think let's let's call it five to ten cameras, something like that. So let's call it five hundred to fifteen hundred bucks, something like that. All of those cameras could connect into a edge device, right? And and let's I'm just going to pick like a Nvidia Jetson, which is a very 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 common. Uh, edge device to do to do this stuff. Nvidia, remember, made their name in like games, gaming, and cri- and crypto. So that's and why those use what are called GPUs, graphical processing units, and that's in computer vision. You need to crunch GPUs. So uh, that's you know anywhere from let's call it six hundred to a thousand bucks, something like that. And then and then our software, our software. Okay, that's. You know, you you need a platform like ours to build the application, train that model, deploy it out onto those cameras, run that twenty four seven. You know, collect all that information and, and so forth. And 
So let's say, you know, we're a SaaS platform, you know, 12 months, you can have as many people banging away on it, but that's like $50,000, something like that. And then you can build as many applications on that as you, as you want. That's just, that's peanuts for what you like. I mean, in, in the case of, you know, signing over a a million dollar check to somebody for getting hurt. I mean, if that prevents that from happening, that this makes a heck of a lot of sense. Oh, I was thinking about, you know, like there's two layers of that. Like there's a side of it as a business owner that I don't want to cut a million dollar check. There's a side of it as a human that I don't want the guy to ever fall off. Of course. And so (laughs) Okay, I, you take the human side, I'll take the business side. I don't want to cut a million both. dollar check. No, I see <laughs> I see both. Right. Yeah, um yeah. I mean, we we worked with uh a pretty well known entertainment venue that has a basically an open leading edge with nets mm-hmm. on the front end. And somebody fell into the net and injured themselves, and there was litigation surrounding that. It would have been really nice to have a thing go off. If you got near that edge, you get over that yellow line you weren't supposed to cross. Because, I mean, it, where we're at is on your honor, which I, I can understand an insurance company saying, you know, I know you you gave me a handshake and said, I, I definitely won't do anything dumb, but experience tells me. And so do all of the like all state commercials and State Farm and anybody else that <laughs> people do really dumb stuff sometimes. <laughs> And so we're going to prevent yes. both that yes. and also the unexpected. It's it's those things that just like I never saw that coming. I didn't know if I drank that much beer and got that close to an open edge, I might fall <laughs> and injure myself. But the sad part of it is like, one, that person's injured. But two, that person sues the company and the company loses. So that uh, preventing it from ever happening is best case for all involved. Yeah, You're still healthy. The company still has their money everybody's a lot better off for this situation. So, but it does feel like it's in your kitchen because I'm sure like yeah. having that thing on your windshield probably feels like, Oh man, big brother's watching. I forget about it, which is part of the problem. I, well, eventually you know? we will. Yeah. I, for, I forget that it's even there. Like the only reason I remember it is because we're talking about, you know, tracking movements and all of that. And it's a very dumb device, you know, it just sticks into the inside of my windshield. It's nothing, it's nothing crazy. Um, and, and I mean, what you're talking about is so much more advanced um, and, and flexible uh, than what than what I have in my truck. And same thing about like materials, you know, it's almost like a visual audit. Like if materials, something happened to materials, you don't have to rely on hearsay. You can literally just say, OK, the materials were there and then something happened. You know, they were stolen or moved or, or something like or, OK, this siding went up. And then did it, did it actually, yeah, it actually did go up in this time frame. I mean, there's just, it's almost like a visual, I don't like the word audit, but it's like a visual trail, right? That's giving you that, that intelligence. But uh, yeah, look, I went through this with mobile, mobile phone security and uh, in my, you know, my mobility uh, career and uh, people have funny, you know, it's funny, our phones were just, were tracked constantly on our phones, but we somehow treat that differently than like a camera that might be looking at us. And then we willingly give away our personal lives on social networking. But again, we're kind of like, we have these strong feelings about, about a camera that's looking. So we're, we're funny people. I'm, I'm a little bit superstitious about, about my phone is that if I say dog food too loud and I scroll on Instagram, it's going to feed me a thing about dog food and how I need to go pick up dog food. We'll put it in the show notes if that actually happened. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. It's totally true. It's it's the craziest thing. All right. Well, dude, this this is such a fun topic, and there are just it, it's going to be interesting to see how it takes shape and how you guys kind of continue to innovate in the construction space and all of that. So. We always we always ask our megaphone question though, right? I think it's a good time. So, if we gave you a megaphone that the entire industry could hear, what, what would you want to say? What would you want to soapbox on for for around sixty seconds? What I said earlier, I really believe, which is the coolest thing about the construction industry and the built worlds, you know, industry is that it's it's real. It's real stuff, right? People are are doing real real stuff, right? And it always had this reputation as not being quote tech techie, but the technology is just coming that 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 way, and it's a combination of 
of high tech and real world that if I was coming out of college or I was coming out of, I, I would seriously consider going there before I would maybe go do this Silicon Valley. I'm going to be, be a coder and go work in a cube or at home somewhere. Right. So I, I think, you know, for me, I just feel like there's so much interesting tech that's getting pushed to the edge of where real life happens that, uh, to me, it'll, it's going to be super fun to see see that play out. I, I know construction has all these labor constraints and, and so but One way it could attract more more people is around that. It is becoming real high tech, right? Like deep learning AI, quote unquote, is happening on construction sites. That's really cool. So I think um, I, I'm excited to see that and see this. Maybe there's a brain migration from what you would consider to be traditional sort of high techy segments into real world segments. And uh, I think that's going to definitely blow up. Right? So that'd be fun to watch. That's a, that's a good megaphone answer right there, man. That's fun. <laughs> All right, Marty, dude, thank you so much for being here and joining us this week, man. Thanks, guys. That was fun. 